These are the feminine features, a few of the feminine features that are associated with maximum fertility and maximum attraction in women. So you have the small jaw, full lips, you can read it all. Uh, we already know what they are. Anything that's attractive in a female basically comes down to hormones, estrogen testosterone ratio. And so does the pheromone production and distribution. Okay, same thing in men. Okay, masculine features, growth of the jaw, brow ridges, all this kind of stuff goes along with testosterone, all these facial features, and masculine pheromone. That's it. This. Simply put, the mind's eyes is a network of nerve cells that integrates hormone responses to pheromones with visual input, with other sensory input from the social environment. And the social environment is other people. That's what makes it species specific. It's, uh, this network of nerve cells manages input from all of the senses, produces the appropriate behavioral response by changing levels of hormones. Okay. So, to sum up what I've said so far, preferences for food and our sexual preferences are conditioned from the day we're born. Odors from food or from other people enter the body through the nose. The mind's eyes reacts, produces this uh, hormone response. But unlike the odors from food, we're only exposed to sex differences in species-specific pheromones through social circumstances that involve other people. It's the unconscious association with other sensory input that allows the pheromones of other people to determine who or what we prefer to see, hear, touch, or taste. If you look at the history of that response, you're going to have to get back to something that involves hormones and conditioning. And the conditioning phenomena is what needs to be explained. So when somebody reports there's a change in oxytocin that's associated with this, if they tracked it back far enough, they'd see that that change was also associated with pheromones. After conditioning to the pheromones, we behave differently than we otherwise would, and differently than someone else does. So that's why your sexual preferences may be very different than someone else's. You have to look back at what your experience has been, and what you imprinted on, or what you associated with what uh, people who prefer redheads to blondes, for example, associated the smell of that redhead or the smell of that blonde with a good experience or a bad experience. You have all these factors that are associated right down to the genetic level, uh, tissue type, basically, that are associated with pheromone production, and that's what's conditioning our behavior. Pheromones from the opposite sex cause levels of luteinizing hormone and testosterone to change. It's very clear in every species of mammal, this is what happens. Uh, luteinizing hormone drives estrogen and testosterone. It gets women who prefer men exhibit an LH and testosterone response to men's pheromones. Men who prefer women exhibit an LH and testosterone response to women's pheromones. We have this animal model that extends very well to humans and I guess that's what uh, first caught my attention was when I learned enough about biology to stop looking at the psychological tests, uh, texts with case studies that didn't really explain anything to me. Um, I started looking at the animal models and saying, well, hey, this really makes sense and there's this hormone that uh, appears to put everything together. Okay, at birth, males respond to the opposite sex female pheromones from their mother with an LH and testosterone surge. That's their first erotically charged experience from a physiological level. Females don't get that response because they don't respond to same-sex pheromones. So immediately at birth, and for about three months afterwards, you've got this tremendous surge of testosterone that's rewiring the male brain in a more masculine direction. And that's when these nerve cells are dividing and uh, proliferating, all the connections are being made. You have a tremendous amount of rewiring that goes on more so than any other time. But, but all throughout life, up until the changes with puberty, you're getting the same kind of conditioned response to the pheromones of the mother or the young, uh, anybody else that's in the social environment. Um, Usually the mother's the most important figure. The breast thing is probably the, the best demonstration because long before
before puberty, from the day of birth, pheromone exposure conditions the hormone responses, LH and testosterone, associated with visually perceived physical characteristics and the features of reproductive fitness. Some of the women that have had male children will be aware that their, uh, their infant male laying by their side or nursing at the breast will get an erection. And they say, oh, isn't that cute? He's got a little woody, right? <laughs> but they have no idea that at the same time he's imprinting on the, on the breast and the pheromones associated with his mother causing a hormone response. And then at puberty, you get that testosterone surge again. It's kind of a physiological reminder of his past and the conditioning. And all of a sudden, adolescent males manifest their conditioned preference for large-breasted females because every breast is large to an infant male.